My name is John Rexage. I'm Director of Climate Change and Energy at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, I've been working on the issue of climate change uh, in a broader sense for some 15 years now. First with the Government of Canada, um, the domestic implementation, and then went on to be a negotiator at Kyoto and beyond. And for the last six, seven years, uh, initiated a program within the International Institute for Sustainable Development on Climate Change and Energy. I have some 15 people around the world uh, who uh, contribute and, and work on our projects. So you got us into this mess. Yes, I'm afraid I am. I'm, I'm one of these things I've noticed in the last two years, I've, I'm starting to be referred as a climate change veteran. And <laughs> oh, uh, no. when that happens, you're saying, oh God, has it gone that far? <laughs> How important uh, do you think uh, carbon capture and storage is going to be to this whole issue of, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? I, it's going to be a very... Uh, critical contributor, particularly in the context of a country like Canada, which is going to be uh, continue to rely on fossil fuels as a very strong part of its economy, particularly on energy exports. But it's far beyond just Canada. If we're going to be talking about China, India, uh, some of the major developing countries. Uh, without carbon capture and storage, uh, there and, and uh, organizations such as the International Energy Agency are uh, pointing out that uh, if we're going to get any significant reductions, carbon capture and storage has to be a very significant part of that. That's also the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In fact, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change suggests that as much as somewhere between 15 and 55 percent of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide will be looked after by carbon capture and storage. Where are you in that, uh, that wide spectrum? I have to say that it's too early to tell at this point. Uh, there clearly seems to be, there was a lot of optimism a few years ago. I think now that there's a lot of um, worries on the financing side. Uh, we had a, a project that was announced by the Bush administration, a few projects that was announced. They've all been uh, deep sixed because the, the monies were thought to be too prodigious. I keep on hearing anecdotally that even in uh, Alberta, as the engineers are uh, drilling down and starting to look into the actual implementation of this technology, that is turning out to be more expensive, not less expensive. And usually when it comes to climate change mitigation, it's the opposite. And so that, that's quite worrisome. Um, I would agree that I think without it at this point in time, I, I don't see the world switching off of fossil fuels in the next 30 to 50 years. Um, and hence CCS uh, is a very, very critical contributor. So if not uh, carbon capture and storage, what are there other options? Uh, well, one would be a, a true uh, technological revolution of one sort or another, and who knows what happens with something like uh, cold fusion or, or one of these other technologies that come out. One never knows from one day to the next what can happen. I mean, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, Chicagoans were asked what is the number one environmental issue for the, what, the, what will be the number one environmental issue for the 20th century, and they said, naturally enough, horse manure. So it's very, very difficult for us to uh, look into the future on this. Um, and uh, so it, it's, it's difficult for me to imagine, if not for CCS, then what would it be? But I think we also have to be very cautious about not m making sure that it's not the be all and end all either. And that we really do have to uh, look at basically the full basket. And that includes energy efficiency, that includes some of the more traditional uh, smaller renewables. Um, but I think it also, for example, over the shorter term, we should not be, you know, we continue to overlook, I think, sometimes uh, the real cost-effective opportunities that exist on the biological sequestration side as well. Agriculture up to six gigatons is uh, predicted, is uh, potentially there in terms of reductions over the next 30 to 40 years. And so while we're making this very expensive transition from an energy infrastructure point of view, which is going to be necessary, we should keep in mind that over the shorter term, we can um, uh, find a lot of cost-effective uh, greenhouse gas reduction opportunities in uh, biological things. So I think it seems pretty clear that uh, if carbon capture and storage works and is a significant factor, it's transitionary. Yes, I would say, but transitionary we're talking over a period of 40 to 50 years. I would expect, and I would dearly hope, and, 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 and I, th I don't think that's unrealistic, that let's say by 20, uh, by 20 uh, 70 or 2080 that in fact uh, we will have uh, definite uh, new clean alternatives in place uh, there will be uh, hydrogen will uh, will have been uh, truly um, uh, uh, become a transformative uh, resource any thoughts as to what that is or 
Well, say? hydrogen, I was saying. I think that uh, for, from my perspective, I think if we uh, make that transition to a hydrogen-based economy, uh, that's probably uh, the, the direction in which the future will uh, unfold. So the role of uh, carbon capture and storage then is, um, is to close out the fossil fuel era, is that? Help to make that transition, yes, I, I would say so. Um, you know, particularly when it comes to, again, we, we tend to look at this in the context of Alberta, and, and I can understand why and when we're looking at it from a Canadian perspective. But how soon, for example, will the United States be able to make the transition? And there's all kinds of now real strong incentives for it to make such a transition. And I think that there will be active support, particularly under the new Obama administration, for trying to accelerate the transition. There's a, the universities, the research laboratories are working hard at this stuff. And it's only and at the end of the day, on the consumption side, that'll really drive this. We are only able to make the kind of transition that we did in terms of development because of our reliance on cheap fossil fuels. And it's not unrealistic to expect China and India to have that same access as well. Mr. Drexage, if you uh, could take all of the money that it looks like we're about to spend on carbon capture and storage, and it will be considerable, uh, and uh, if you could bypass this whole period, what would you spend it on? Oh, I think by far and away the most important thing is uh, developing uh, governance and developing strong infrastructure in uh, developing countries. Hmm. I mean, I think we are still so far away for the vast, vast majority of people, and that and that population is only growing, who are in completely dire circumstances. Um, and, and it causes all kinds of issues as far as uh, future development is concerned. So I'd put all my resources, and frankly, even right now, if I, if I had my druthers, in development. So what will it take to get uh, carbon capture and storage beyond the phase of being a demonstration sport? Um, we, need a, we need a sufficiently high price cycle. And that's uh, what's going to drive innovation, and that's what's going to drive the green revolution, including uh, carbon capture and storage more than anything else. We need a, a very clear carbon price signal. And how do we do that? How do you think we should do that? I'm not going to be theological about it. You know, if in Canada <laughs> we're, uh, it, it, the carbon tax doesn't work for, for reasons related, or in North America it doesn't work, then let's go with a cap and trade system. But let's try and uh, initiate something. Uh, develop something that uh, will give that price signal. I mean, for me, the genius of Kyoto wasn't whether countries met their targets or not. Uh, its effectiveness will be judged in 30, 40 years time as to whether or not it set the first price signal on carbon and that it maintained and grew on that price signal. So once again, I, I'd like to close on this. What, what do you think the long-term role of CCS or carbon capture and storage can be? Well, I think it can be a very effective transitory mechanism for countries like Norway or countries like Canada and Australia, the developed context, who are major, who rely to a large extent on their economies for fossil fuels. Um, and I also think it can have uh, help uh, major developing countries like China and India in making their transition. Um, but I would agree that uh, this should only be seen in the context as a transitory mechanism over the next few decades, and that what's going to push it more than anything else is the uh, innovation that is almost certain to come out of uh, the labs in the United States. So, so is there anything else I should ask you or is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, only that I think one does have to, I, I, yeah, there is one thing I would like to add and that there's a very, very unique Canadian wrinkle when it comes to carbon capture and storage and that's called the oil sands. And so I think that there's a level of support uh, around the world for carbon capture and storage when it comes to coal plants and, and, and trying to make that transition. There is a, an entirely different dynamic when it comes to the oil sands. And many people want to stop the oil sands from happening regardless of whether there's carbon capture and storage or not. And it's taken almost like, I call it seal-like proportions, the baby seal-like proportions in terms of uh, the unpopularity of uh, the oil sands internationally. Like I, I regularly travel now over to Europe and into the United States and it's astounding the degree to which oil sands is vilified. So, and CCS technology is not the only solution for that one. There's a whole uh, array of issues related to uh, local envir environmental and water issues as well that I think need to be more effectively addressed uh, if uh, we don't want the oil sands to be at risk. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.